This pilot rejected his landing and instantly regretted it. In this video, I'm gonna explain exactly what he did wrong, why he crashed, and what was wrong with his plane. Now you can see it looks like any other plane flying around the airport, but the reason this guy is filming him is because he heard the pilot say on the radio that he had engine trouble. And you can see that the engine is still running at this point, so this should be an easy recovery, but watch what he does because it's kind of hard to see. Yeah, he lost his engine. What is he doing? He's still flying. He's flying. He's still flying. Ah. Why would you try to take off again if you have engine trouble? And what should the pilot have done differently? I'm Hoover and welcome to your pilot debrief. Now this mishap took place at North Perry Airport just west of Hollywood, Florida. Now you can see the airspace around here is pretty busy because you've got the Fort Lauderdale Airport here to the north and Miami Opelika down here to the south. But for small general aviation aircraft, it's a great place to fly in and out of. The pilot is flying a TL2000 Sting Sport, which is a two seat carbon fiber light sport aircraft. And he said he's owned the plane for just over two years and he has about 200 hours of total time with only about a hundred hours in the sting now that means he's averaging just over four hours of flying a month but about a month prior to this he did a flight with a cfi to knock out his biannual flight review so that's good to know but a hundred hours over the course of two years isn't a lot of experience to be able to fall back on when you have an emergency he initially took off from runway 28 right and the winds are 310 at seven knots now he said his first indication of trouble was the climb rate was only about 400 feet per minute and he usually has to try to keep it from going past 500 feet per minute and remember this is a lightweight sport aircraft so it can climb out at 700 or 800 feet per minute without any problem at sea level and as he's recognizing that there's a problem that's when the engine starts to sputter now we've talked about the impossible turn on this channel, which is when you lose an engine on takeoff, you typically aren't gonna have the altitude to turn back around and try and land. But as long as you have some engine power, it's okay to start that turn, but this is where you're gonna have to pay real close attention to what the engine is doing and watch the trend in your airspeed. And you really wanna make sure you don't panic and try to yank it back around because you still wanna avoid exceeding the critical angle of attack and stalling. And he initially does a good job because he had already started to turn to the right in accordance with his takeoff clearance. And then he tells the tower that he's got a problem and they immediately clear him to land on any available runway. Remember, you wanna aviate, navigate, and then communicate. Keep the plane flying, find a spot to land, and then talk to the tower. If we take a look at the map here, you can see that one of the threats is the congestion around the airport. Now all of these streets are probably gonna be filled with cars. So really your only option is to fly a pattern that's going to keep you within a gliding distance of the field in case you do end up losing the engine completely. And that's probably why he said in his written statement that he purposely kept all my turns as tight as I could as I did not wanna go down on the surrounding streets or residential areas. So it's good that he's thinking about this, but the problem is you don't wanna to fly too close to the field or it actually ends up creating more problems for you. So his game plan was to come back and land on runway 19 right, which if we look at the imagery seems like the best option in my opinion, because he didn't extend far enough on takeoff to try to make a teardrop turn back to the runway that he departed from. But let's go back to the aviate part of the emergency because there's a few things he needs to be doing or at least thinking about right now. First of all, he needs to maintain 70 knots because that's the speed listed as step one in the checklist, whether you have an engine failure on takeoff or you're doing a precautionary landing with engine power. The next step in both of these checklists is to lower the flaps to half. And as you're doing that, you need to be thinking about how does my pattern spacing look? Am I tight? Am I wide? What's my altitude? Because you want to make sure that at any point, if that engine quits, especially if you're on the downwind, that you've got enough altitude to make two 90 degree turns back to the runway. If it's me and the engine is still working, I'm going to keep a shallow climb going as long as I'm not losing airspeed until it's time to turn base 
or until I feel confident that I can make it back to land on the runway if the engine stops, because it's always easier to slip off an extra 100 feet of altitude than to wish you had another 100 feet in order to make it to the runway. Unfortunately, one of the things that the NTSB and the pilot didn't mention is what kind of power the engine was producing, because the only thing the pilot said was that the engine shuddered. But you can see in the video here that the propeller is still turning, so we know he's at least got partial power. And we're going to take a look at this graphic here to break down the mistakes he made in a second. But for now, let's talk about why he had the engine problem to begin with. According to the NTSB, examination of the fuel system revealed that the fuel strainer was full of fuel that was yellow in color and exhibited small rust colored debris in the bottom of the strainer bowl. And you've got two types of fuel that you can use in this plane. You're supposed to use 92 unleaded, also called MOGAS, which is the same stuff that you would put in your car and it's yellowish in color. But the pilot said that because many airports don't carry MOGAS, he's forced to use 100 low lead, also known as AVGAS, which is bluish in color, and that's allowed, but no more than 30% of the time. Now he goes on to talk about some of the recent flights where he put in about 10 gallons of AVGAS, but the week before the mishap, he actually filled up with MOGAS. When the NTSB looked at the carburetors, they found the right one was full of fuel that was yellow and debris was at the bottom of the float chamber that was large enough to block the main jet. The left carburetor looked the same, also with debris in it, except one of the floats was sunk to the bottom of the float chamber. The reason this is bad is because according to Rotax, the problem with the floats absorbing more fuel is that it could lead to incorrect fuel regulation, which could result in a rough running engine, especially at low speeds or a loss of performance. The maintenance manual directed that at 200 hours, the carburetor should be removed for inspection for debris and the weight of the floats checked. However, review of maintenance records did not indicate that any maintenance actions regarding weighing and or replacement of the floats had ever been accomplished, nor that the float chamber had ever been checked for any debris particles after fuel line replacement. After the accident, the NTSB removed the debris from the carburetor's float chambers and did an engine test run and no anomalies were noted. But now that we know why he had an engine problem, let's see what he should have done differently and what kind of damage it did to the plane and to him. Take a look at this image that the NTSB made using the data from the onboard GPS. Now keep in mind that these are all ground speeds and the winds are 3107 knots. The first thing to highlight is he only got 300 feet in the air and then he started descending as he did that right hand turn to the downwind. He's also a little slow because he should be 70 knots right at this point, but I don't know if he's slow because the engine is struggling or probably he's just looking outside at the field too much trying to make the turn and not necessarily paying as much attention to his altitude and airspeed. If he's not able to maintain altitude and airspeed, then he needs to be thinking about step two of the checklist, which is to lower the flaps to half, because that's gonna help him generate more lift and he'll have a lower stall speed. The biggest problem though is he doesn't touch the flaps at all and he never even really rolls out on the downwind. He just kind of keeps that right hand turn going, putting him essentially on a base leg, a beam the end of the runway. And he said that when he was flying, he felt like he was gonna have more than half of the runway to complete the landing, which would have been about 1600 feet. But but in my opinion, the problem is he's just too focused on trying not to overfly any of the buildings and he's trying to make these really tight turns. And although it's easily possible for him to land and stop with only half of the runway remaining, he doesn't have the skills necessary to pull it off in this emergency. And the fact that he doesn't use his flaps is going to make things a lot worse. He should have just rolled out on the downwind while the engine was still running, and then he could have started his turn to base using normal pattern spacing, or at least gave himself some more room, even if it meant overflying those buildings, because then he could have planned on using the full runway. And honestly, doing that probably would have given him a few seconds to realize that he actually needed to put his flaps out. Instead, because he started that base turn early, when he rolls out on final, he's crossing the displaced threshold 180 feet in the air and doing 62 knots ground speed. And that's not necessarily too fast, but this is where he needs to be going full flaps. And then he can forward slip the aircraft to lose any altitude, which is what I talked about in my last video when the pilot was concerned he wasn't going to have enough room in front of him to land but instead he just noses over. And he said that his steep angle and speed made the plane bounce a few times. And look at what he says here. Although I was holding the throttle back hard, rather than slow down, the plane seemed to gain speed. 
Now the NTSB data here showed that with 1600 feet of runway remaining, he was doing 75 knots ground speed, but that's all because he pushed forward on the stick in a slick aircraft to try and lose that altitude. And it's just not going to slow down no matter how hard you pull back on the throttle. He said he hit the brakes and he thought about shutting down the engine, but he felt like he was running out of runway fast. And he said his choices were to cartwheel with a lot of speed when he hit the grass at the end of the runway and onto the perimeter road, or even the parkway beyond, or bleed off the speed on a go around. Okay, let's take a look at reality. Just forget about landing long. You're on the ground now, you've hit the runway. The aircraft manual shows that with full flaps, your landing roll is only 390 feet. You're 16 feet in the air right here, probably because of that first bounce. You've got 1600 feet of runway in front of you, but you also have another 700 feet of nice flat ground over here before you hit the fence by the road. You've got plenty of room to stop, just shut down the engine. If you go off the runway, you're probably not gonna go cartwheeling. The Sting Sport is capable of soft field landings and if all you're doing is rolling off the end of the runway, you should be slow enough that you're gonna be just fine. However, he decides to just take it flying again, and this is a terrible idea and probably the worst decision that you could make in this situation as a pilot. You're far more likely to die trying to take off with a bad engine than you are going off the end of the runway at slow speed onto the nice flat ground. And you can see right here that he doesn't manage to get higher than about 40 feet in the air on the attempt, and he said the throttle didn't respond when he tried to increase the power. And what's funny to me is he was so worried about cartwheeling off the end of the runway but he said that I decided I could land it in the grass if I couldn't gain enough altitude to complete the go around. So it's okay to probably slam it into the ground if you can't do the go around, but it's not okay to go off the end of the runway at a slow speed. Unfortunately, the engine never responded and he crashed in the grass field inside the perimeter fence. And you can see the damage that it did to the aircraft in these photos here, which is a lot more damage than probably what he would have had if he had just rolled off the end of the runway. However, the pilot was able to walk away without really any injuries, which is kind of remarkable. Overall, it was only a few simple mistakes, but they kept adding up to make the problem worse. And that's why my advice would be that as soon as you're down on the runway with a bad engine, you should probably just stay there. And if you found this debrief helpful, then you should check out this other video on the screen here to learn how a helicopter could make you crash. And I'll see you next time.